a faulty switch fuseman elevator rated for 63 amps. And this was sent by Richard, who said that he was called out to investigate the loss of power to a lift. And when he got there, there was a phase down and he traced it back to this isolator. And the fuses were all intact, but uh, one of the connections had failed in it. And it's this connection here because I've tested it. So a quick, uh, a quick overview of this. This is the sort of thing you'll find. This is the module you'll find in those uh, isolators that have the big, huge metal handle in the front that as you turn it, it's like takes a lot of force and then it goes a real loud bang when it goes across. And the point of these is that they're very high current rating, very high fault current rating. And uh, they've got the safety interlock on the panel that as the panel closes, it goes into this uh, and that's the handle in the front actuates this mechanism inside but it uses a lot of force to make sure the contacts really do separate. And this is technically called a, called a switch fuse. Now, it was when I learned electrics. I, I don't know if they've changed terminology since. They do that quite a lot. But the reason it's called a switch fuse is because it doubles up as the isolator of the switch and it's got the fuses. The fuses in this instance are HRC uh, TIS 63 amp by Lawson. Um, and the HRC high rupture capacity means that the fuse wire through this ceramic insert here is going through a filling of silica sand. And the silica sand, when the fuse wire fails, the silica then melts like, it turns into glass inside and fills the void, so to speak. And that breaks the circuit and it can break a very high current. In this case, it's rated something like 80,000 amps it can break, which is needed for industrial stuff. Now, I would show you this operating, but there's not much to see. And if I actually actuate this, it takes a lot of force. The only way I could do it was with a file there in it. Um, and uh, it's so loud that it would just basically, it would just cause distortion and make a lot of speaker noise. So I'm not going to do that. Other things were the note here. So the fuses, once, when the isolator is open, there's no connection to the fuses. I can demonstrate that with the meter. But... As always, even when you've operated any isolator, always use test lamps to check to ground and other. So this is uh, fully open, it's isolated, both sides. So there's no connection. The neutral connection will be bridged through because the neutral connection stays intact all the time. There is a link that you can actually remove to actually do electrical tests without neutral, but that must be put in again afterwards. An open neutral is a terrible thing you get strange random voltages in the phases depending on the loading. Right, I'm going to open this now. And, oh, things worthy of note as well. If you have something like this in a job and there's any likelihood, well, the fuses will blow at some point, it's not that expensive to buy these fuses in industrial terms. They're about five pounds each plus VAT. You can get them in a box of 10, get lots of spares and leave them in the enclosure so that if the day it does eventually blow a fuse, You've not just got the option of putting a new one in just to see in case it was just like it was just a, a tired fuse or a random glitch that caused it to blow. But some spares just in case you put that fuse in and another one blows and then you have to find the actual fault and then uh, replace the fuse. Generally speaking, if a fuse blows, you should be looking for a fault. Anyway, let's start taking this to bits. I'm not sure how dangerous this is going to be. I'm kind of toying with sticking gloves on because... Uh, this thing does contain a mofo spring. Oh, it's a long screw. Uh, I'm going to put gloves on because uh, this does pose a slight risk of impalement. Actually, no, no, I'll use this one. One grubby glove and I don't know where I've put the other one. Port West Mechanics Gloves. I quite like them. They do them in big sizes, which is uh, why I like them. So I'm going to have one old glove and one new glove. I could just put on two new gloves, but this is how it is. This will at least shield the blood from you if I have an instant with this uh, spring-loaded apparatus. Oh, another thing. If the fuse blows, don't replace it with a bit of wire. Do not wrap wire around these. Do not twist wire around the end of the screws and clamp it down because the point of the HRC fuse is that it will break very high current faults and if you don't do that, because this metal works all connected to ground effectively in the panel, if you were to just wrap a bit of wire around here and that was to blow with a plasma arc between it with the high current and it flashed onto the uh, grounded metal work, you'd be most of the way to an electrical explosion. And uh, if that somehow engulfed in the panel and bridged onto the others, that's what these barriers are here for. 
uh, and it bridged the phases, you could have a very, very big electrical explosion in your hands. And burns and embarrassment, knocking power out to buildings and all manner of stuff. Just be aware of stuff like that, it's important. Now... I've never taken one of these before, apart before, mainly because I've never had one thing. That's a testament to their reliability. Okay, is this going to be straightforward to get to bits? I'm not sure. Let's take the other end off. They are pretty rugged. The industrial stuff has to be. They rarely get operated, but sometimes there's an advantage to turn them off and on again once every so often, just to kind of like wipe the contacts. This is where gloves are actually a nuisance. Someone at Dorman Smith Technical Department is probably saying, uh, no, don't do that. Don't take it apart like that. Oh no, it's about to explode into millions of pieces and fire shrapnel everywhere. Ooh. Right. Okay, where do we go from now? Let's take these screws out from the bottom. And we'll see what happens. I could pause, but the option you have is to skip forward if you wish. Some people hate it when I pause. Some people prefer it when I pause. The option is entirely yours. So this is modular. I can see it's built from the four modules. One is the neutral module, which uh, I've just smeared grease everywhere. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing really new about that. Uh, one is the neutral module, which also contains the actuator mechanism. I'm thinking this whole thing will come out intact. This is good. That's going to keep the spring from pinging. So when, uh, in the case of the elevator, as soon as the phase went down, the elevator would most likely have shut down on detection of the loss of a phase because most equipment has a relay in it called a phase failure detection relay. In the case of heavily integrated, you know, mass-produced items like elevators, the circuit board will have the phase monitoring on it, which it will, uh, it will monitor for the presence of the phase. It will possibly monitor for voltage level as well. But it's really looking for direction of the phase to the motor. If someone does some work, maybe external to the building, and swaps the phases accidentally, it means the, the elevator is not going to try and run reverse the older ones. But not that that is such an issue these days, because everything seems to be variable frequency drives. This whole thing is coming out now. This is good. Oh, there's, there's the big spring that I didn't want mashed with. Right, what can I do here? What can I get this off with? Has that pin, I think that has been pushed through to actually lock this into place. That's a little bit annoying. Yeah. That is a rivet that's being banged in. That's okay. Oh, actually, you know what? Everything's just falling apart anyway. Excellent. Here's the faulty one. So this is the, the common pin that is used to actuate these mechanisms. How much force does it take to actuate it? I'm not sure. I think most of the springing mechanism is actually in that device under there. Oh, actually, you know what? This rotating bit here is possibly, yeah, this fairly decisively, but although there's a, a latching effect in here, it's not like the main thing. The main decisive action is definitely in this uh, section at the bottom. Right, tell you what, where's the faulty one? The faulty one is the one that we want. I can see some screws. This could also be spring that, that pings. That uh, bit of plastic that's just dropped out might be quite important. Let's take these screws out. Some of the older stuff is so rugged compared to... Well, that sounds like an old man talking now, doesn't it? The old stuff is really rugged. 
On my first day in the steelworks, uh, we were installing old slate DC switchgear, vintage Frankenstein stuff, purely because it simply, it was easier to service and more reliable than the old stuff, than the new stuff, should I say. Is that more or less coming out? Hold on, almost there. Bear with me. Oh, this is kind of parting. It's kind of parting. It's parting. Oh. Yeah, see all those bits that just fell out? Probably I wanted to leave those in place. Radio. So the contacts, yeah, that wasn't terribly helpful. That wasn't terribly helpful. But what I'm seeing here is uh, the contact actuators and the contacts themselves. Everything is just dropping out. I'm just trying to see what's actually happening here. Uh, now, I'll just regard this as the rehearsal right. I'll take the contacts out of this one, but now I'm going to take another one apart and I'm going to try and take it apart in a manner that it doesn't instantly fall into lots of pieces. I think I'm onto plums here. I think it's actually going to fall into lots of pieces. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this spring here has burned. It's been overheated and it's melted. Right, so let's take this one apart, right? Oh, wrong screwdriver. And we'll see what that's supposed to look like. So this time I'll hold it tightly together and I'll carefully lift it off another side. So that's one nut done. I may also, just to keep things in position, I may also pop the actuator rod through here. And we'll see if we can spot how this thing is supposed to work. You know what, I'm going to get these gloves off. These gloves are a pain in the arse. They're fine when you're actually, you need them, but uh, not when you need finesse. Right, I'm going to pop this through here. And I'm going to carefully lift this up. Is it going to, is it going to pop into millions of pieces again? It's got those little stacks of plates. Oh, they are arc quenching uh, plates. That's not too bad, right? Tell you what, let's remove them because uh, they're not totally needed. Yeah, I'll take that out and I'll tip them out. Uh, and then we'll retake this and we'll see what happens. Oh, it's not that complicated. It's not that complicated. It does rely on that decisive slamming mechanism and all it's doing is it's rotating these contacts into position against each other. I thought there might have been a bit more sliding movement in the contacts, but there's not. And that spring is to provide the pressure of pushing that contact down. So if I go back to this other one that was uh, faulty, there's a possibility, well, that's why that contact is probably uh, sitting loose in there. That was the faulty contact. It's spring was sprung. It looks as though the spring had actually carried current in some way. The contacts look absolutely fine. This is obviously designed to be used for a higher current one as well. Where this contact rubs, it's, it's good enough. It's absolutely fine. What's been missing here is that spring was supposed to push that contact down. Let's get this one out and show you that. Can I lift this out? Oop. Can you see the spring? The spring in there looks a bit crusty as well. But that little spring in there was the bit that was supposed to provide pressure against this. And what's happened there is because that spring has failed, fatigued or corroded, it's, it looks kind of crusty. It looks as though maybe it's been subject to passage of current. It's got that slightly splattered look to it. 
um, which suggests that, yeah, so what other path of current would there be? I'm not sure quite the mechanism of how that would have felt like that. But all this thing is doing is it's pushing the contacts across and then that spring is taking up the slack. But in this case, because that spring had basically broken and collapsed, uh, the contact was just basically sitting loose. So it wasn't actually making contacts. So nothing really major that would have caused arcing. Uh, so that's more or less it. That's what it is. Strange how this is burnt. I'm trying to understand the mechanism of why that would... Pass current. I, I don't think it was just sort of electrolytic corrosion. And really, the main current carrying bits are this contact comes right down over here, uh, and that's what that contact pivots on. Unless somehow that contact had just not made contact at the back. Oh, actually, you know what? This is also effectively a contact, isn't it? Oh, that is kind of a rocking contact. So I wonder if it uh, made an, intermi it's an intermittent connection in there, and that's what caused the problem. You're just going to have to bear with me as I, as I fumble about here. Oh, you know what? Here's another thing that may have actually contributed to that. That's full of air, uh, sand. And if the sand got in between the contact, it's possible that a fuse has failed in the past or been broken and it's gone into this, even during shipping. Uh, and the silica sand has gone in and it's possible that it found its way between this pivoting contact here and uh, then the current may have actually gone through the spring instead and that would have burnt out the spring. Oh, that's interesting. That's probably a failure mode they didn't really expect. And I can see a very slight bit of pitting in the bottom of that, but is that the same contact that I took out? I think it is the one. I've not taken one of the other ones out. This is it. So there is a slight pitting there. So if that sand had actually got under there, yeah, it could have taken the current path through the spring. And that does look like what's happened. It's actually melted the spring by becoming a conductor of that high current for the elevator. So that kind of, I think that's actually it then. I think that's, that is my conclusion. It is a, that's what's caused the failure. It's the spring has been, has carried current when it shouldn't have because of contamination inside this. And uh, that's possibly what's caused this to fail. And the most likely cause of the contamination is uh, the silica sand out of one of these fuses that may somehow have got broken in the past, possibly before installation. But there we go. Interesting stuff.